baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how you obtain, amen, this, this promised land. That's how you obtain the Spirit of God in your life, uh, amen. But it takes more effort and takes more work to maintain that. See, to possess the promises of God in your life. You know, I've seen many people come to the altar in a moment of sincere repentance. God fills them with the Holy Ghost. And they get up and they walk out and they never come back to that altar of repentance. Uh, and they go back and they live a horrible life. Uh, and they don't follow God and they don't follow the things of God. Uh, amen. But in that moment of repentance, God honored their faith and their repentance. Uh, and he filled them with the Holy Ghost. Uh, Amen. Uh, amen. You, you, you may be able to get close, uh, amen, uh, uh, to the presence of God, but uh, to actually possess the power that God has in store for you, uh, it demands purity. Uh, it demands sanctification. Uh, amen. It demands, uh, amen, the, the, the dying out to your flesh. Amen. See, purity, thank you very much. Purity produces power to possess. Amen. Purity produces power to possess the promises of God. Amen. Too many of us were content with visiting your promise. You visit the benefits. You occasionally visit your destiny. Every once in a while you'll come to church and boom, God fills you full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and you experience, uh, amen, just a little bit of where God wants to take you uh, and where he wants you to live uh, and where he wants you to stay, uh, amen. But you just come sporadically uh, and you receive, uh, amen, just a little bit of what God has for you. But you're unable to maintain the possession. Amen. You can't settle there or inhabit that place because of lack of purity. Amen. Your God-given talent uh, will only get you so far. Uh, amen. But it's your character uh, that will enable you to stay there. Uh, amen. To walk in the Spirit. Uh, to live in the Spirit. Uh, amen. To, to, to not just uh, have the Spirit of God fall upon you and be touched by Him. Uh, but to walk in the Spirit of God. Amen. Samson was a tremendous example of what not to do and how not to live your life for God. Amen. He had those momentary brushes of the Spirit. Amen. amen. Where the Spirit of God would fall upon him. And he would do a great and mighty feat. Amen. But his life was a life of carnality and flesh. Amen. There was no sanctification. There was no holiness. Amen. But it was a life living after his own pleasures. Amen. He was unable, you know, Samson, God gave him supernatural strength. Uh, he, was, he was supposed to walk in that and lead the people of, uh, of Israel. He was supposed to judge Israel. And his supernatural strength uh, was going to be something that was going to cause uh, the nations all around to fear. But if you read the book of, talking about Samson in Judges. Samson never once <coughs> did anything for the people of Israel. Right. You say, well, he slayed the thousands with the dumps, dump, dump, dump. The people of Israel were delivering him to the Philistines because he just caught the Philistines' harvest on fire. Yeah. yeah. Every, every, every battle, everything Samson got himself into was because of his own fleshly will. Right. Amen. He went down the tent and saw a woman of the Philistines, uh, and he said, "I want to marry her." Uh, and then he gets deceived, uh, and then and, 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 and she gets married up to someone else. Uh, and so he grabs a bunch of foxes uh, and ties their tails together and lights them on fire and destroys the crop of the Philistines. Uh, and, and it's all because of him. It ain't for Israel. It's because he was mad. Uh, amen. Because he didn't get his way. Uh, amen. And so he destroyed the crops of the Philistines. Uh, and so the Philistines come to them. Come to the leaders of Israel uh, and say you better give us a Samson uh, or we're going to take you guys out. We're going to wipe you out. And so the people of Israel, they get Samson, they bind him up and they take him to the Philistines. And now in the fleshly carnal state, the spirit of God falls upon Samson. And he finds the, 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 the job 
on of a donkey. And he, he kills a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Amen. That supernatural strength. And it wasn't for the people of Israel. Then Samson goes and finding, finding himself in bed with a harlot. It wasn't for Israel. And the people of the, Philist of the Philistines, they said, we got him now. We're going to shut the gates of the city. We've got him. And Samson goes in the morning time and he lifts up the gates of the city and takes them on top of a hill and throws them down. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Supernatural strength. Uh, amen. He had brushes. Uh, amen. The Bible says that the Spirit of God would fall upon him. Uh, yeah. Amen. When he would shake himself. Uh, amen. God would respond to him uh, even though he wasn't right. Uh, God was not condoning anything that he was doing. Uh, he was not condoning any of his actions. Uh, and even though he was not being a judge for Israel. The Spirit of God would fall upon him and he would have a brush of the Spirit and he would think that he's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, he finds himself in the lap of a foreign woman. And there, his greatest, I mean, all of his mistakes were horrible, but his greatest mistake was there because he told the final secret, the final straw of where his strength lies. And as soon as he revealed that, the enemy took it from him. Oh, yeah. And he was put in chains. Uh, he was put in, in shackles. Uh, his eyes were plucked from him. Uh, amen. Uh, and, and the story of Samson uh, is that he killed more in his death uh, than he ever did in his amen. life. Uh, you know why? Because uh, he never had his heart turned towards God. Uh, oh. Amen. He, he had the supernatural ability uh, that God had planned to use him for great and mighty things. Uh, amen. But he chose a different path. Uh, and so in his death, uh, as the Spirit of God fell upon him, uh, one last time, uh, he destroyed more of the enemy in his death. You see, Samson was unable to possess the promises of God. You see, there was a period of time. There was a period of time in which Samson's strength was like every other man. His hair was cut. I heard a preacher preach one time, pretty good thought. He preached rowing in the dark. Rowing in the dark. But he says that as he was blind and pushing, that his hair begins to grow. His hair begins to grow. And you know what? You know what? God was not honoring Samson. Yeah. He was honoring the he was honoring the calling that he placed on that unborn child when he told the mother of that of that child, yeah. "I'm gonna, he's gonna be a Nazarite. I'm gonna place an anointing on him. I mean, he's gonna be a judge. I'm gonna use him." Amen. And then, however, Samson lacked purity. He lacked sanctification in his life. Oh, the story of Samson could have been so much different. If you sure. Know. Amen. We could have read about the long reign of Samson as he led the people in the fear of God. And as he walked after God, and as he shunned the things of the world and, and all the lures that the devil was throwing his way, as he as he abstained himself from those. But but the story of Samson is completely different, where he lived his life uh, uh, just for himself. Amen. can't settle or inhabit the place where God wants to take you with a, if you have a lack of purity in your heart. God-given talent will get you so far. Character will enable you to stay. Amen. Are you ready to possess your promise tonight? Amen. Amen. You need to take some time and get things cleaned up and cleaned out. You'll never be able to possess until you first allow God to purify. See, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of con 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 Amen. I can't say that word. 
Amen. What Brother Brian said. <laughs> Even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Right. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not God, man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. The day of trying to live in the promised land, but yet staying as close to the filth of this culture that we live in is over. Yeah. Amen. You cannot possess without purity. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Healing comes before possession. <laughs> Amen. Before you could possess the promises of God. Amen. You notice in Joshua 5, in verse 8, it says, And it came to pass that when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Amen. They waited to go forward until they had been healed. Amen. The word doesn't just say that they stayed in the camp, but specifically that they stayed in the camp in their specific place until they were whole. Amen. I'm convinced that too many, uh, amen, of us want to do battle uh, before we are whole. Uh, yeah. Amen. We don't want to stay in the place uh, that God has designed for you right now uh, because it's a place of healing. Uh, it's a place uh, where he's strengthening you uh, for the battle ahead. Yeah. Amen. Oftentimes we get like Abraham and Sarah and we kind of Shotgun God's plan. Amen. Trying to figure it out. God, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for this. And God is saying, you know, first I need you to heal. I, I need there to be, I need you to be whole as you are progressing forward. You see, God has a place that he wants us to stay in and to heal in. We must learn to stay in the place that God has placed us. Uh, amen. And we must follow his voice as he leads us forward. Amen. See, the whole key to, to possessing the promises of God is simply following his voice. Right. Amen. You know, the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And another they will not follow. Amen. As Jesus leads you and calls you uh, and, and brings you through, uh, again, wherever you're going through and whatever struggles, whatever battles that you're facing, uh, amen, uh, amen. God wants you to understand that it's very important, uh, amen, to follow him as he leads. Amen. You want to possess the promises of God, amen, we must follow him as he leads. You know, sometimes our environment can be tough. And sometimes we can hurt, we can have pain, and we can, we can relive issues that have happened, or we can cry, and we can do all sorts of things in, in which we are, oh, our, our vision and, our, and our, the, the reflection of our eyes is inwardly. But you see, God changes our life uh, by changing our revelation uh, or perspective uh, and not always our environment. You know, I, I was talking to someone uh, the other night and uh, they were telling me about how tough their life has been. How it's been really struck. They've really been going through really horrible trials and uh, they told me they said I don't know why God is making me go through this I don't know why I'm having to face this they had the question away I don't know why God is and as I was as, as, uh, as I was talking to them I, the story of Gehazi and Elisha came to mind and I told them the story I, you know could it be, I had to do this delicately because I didn't want to hurt even more. I said, could it be that your perspective needs to change about the situation? You know, the king of Syria, he got really mad one time because the prophet of God, Elisha, was telling the king of Israel all of the secrets that were made 
and all the plans that were made in secret. Amen. God was telling them to Elisha, and Elisha was telling them to the king. And so the king of Israel, he was avoiding all these traps and all these things uh, that Syria, that the king of Syria was bringing against him. And so, and so the king of Syria begins asking around, and the word comes back that, that there is a prophet in Israel that has been revealing your secrets to the king of Israel. And so this, this king of Syria, he, he gathers his entire army to come after one man. His entire army, not just the special forces, not just, you know, not just, you know, just the elite guys. His entire I mean, they muster up all their guys, and they surround Elisha. They surround uh, Elisha's city, and where Elisha was staying, they surround, they completely surrounded the host of the Syrians. They were encamped all around Elisha. <coughs> And Elisha's servant walks out in, in the wee hours of the morning and he looks out and he says, and he runs back in in a terrible fright and he says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? <laughs> Did you? I heard Jeff Ardo preach one time and he does a really great impression of Gehazi. <laughs> he goes, well, What are we going to do? He was so terrified, so afraid, so frightened. Because all he saw was the Syrians. This bad problem. And they were coming after Elisha. And, and <laughs> Gehazi by default. Because Gehazi was Elisha's manservant. And I told Brendan the other day, I said, I told him, I said, you're a manservant. <laughs> so like Elisha was to Elijah. Come on now. Which I'm not Elijah. Amen. But uh, it's decent, but Gehazi was Elisha's mentor. Gehazi, you know, if Gehazi had not have gotten greedy with Naaman, yeah. we would have, I really believe that we would, would have been reading about another prophet after Elisha that did some great and powerful feats and that stood in the face of the kings that were that were rebelling against God. Yeah. Gehazi was being groomed. Just like, uh, see, Elisha was Elijah's man servant. He walked with him. He took care of him. He, he, he was with him all the time. And then Elijah got taken, and, and Elisha received that double portion. And so Elisha, he too had someone that was walking with him, and that was helping him, and, and that, was, that was witnessing all the miracles uh, that was happening. And so by default, Gehazi was in the bullseye of the enemy. And then all of the Syrians were surrounding Amen. The city and surrounding Elisha, coming after Elisha and Gehazi by the phone. And so Gehazi was afraid. And he says, he runs back in and he says, The last my master, what are we going to do? And uh, Elisha, he says, Oh, they let me for us for greater. He knows that me. And, uh, you know, and Gehazi doesn't know, understand. He's like, where are they at? All I see are the Syrians. And they're coming after us. <coughs> Amen. Maybe at that time, Gehazi was wishing he had went to a different temp agency. Yeah. Amen. He's like, man, this guy is dangerous. Amen. We, we, got, we got an entire nation invading Israel and coming after the guy that I'm with. He's on their most wanted list. And it wasn't just Seal Team 6 going in and taking them out. It was the entire army of the Syrians. Yeah. Amen. Surrounding. The Hazai. He says, where are they at? I don't see them. All I see is. And Elisha prays. And says, Lord, open his eyes. That he they see. What? Gehazi? And I'm sure Gehazi could have said, I can see just fine. I see the problem. I see the Syrians. I see everything that is surrounding my life. I see all the negative that is happening in my life. I see everything that's happening. I don't understand why it's happening, now, but I see it coming against me. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. The Bible says that the Lord opened his eyes. That the mountains surrounding Elisha and the Syrian 
Christ. Yeah. We're filled with flaming chariots of fire, an angelic host of angels uh, that were surrounding not only Elisha, but Elisha's problem. Uh, yeah. Oh, let me tell you, uh, sometimes you need to get a change uh, of your perspective. Uh, and you need to get a change of your perspective.
And, and I had a stutter. I was very, I was very unsure. And I was like, how in the world, God, could you ever use me, amen, to preach and to do anything? Because when I got in front of a crowd, I was very easily intimidated. How could you ever use me? Amen. And I read something in Revelation where, where John, and you know, I, and I may have taken it completely out of context, but God knew my heart, and God, he, he molded his word to my young cry. And I said, Lord, anoint my eyes with eyesight that I may see. Help me to see me as you see me. Help me to see my life and your plans for me and my life the way that you see me. God, I don't want to look at all my failures. I don't want to look at all my mistakes. Uh, but God, uh, I, if I fall, I want to get back up and keep going. And I want to, I want to see, I want to see my life as you see me. And Lord, anoint my eyes with my sight. The story of Gehazi was a comfort to me many times. I used to pray that scripture. I did. I used to pray the scripture. Lord, let me see. Help me to see, Lord. Help me not to just look at what is seen. The things that are seen are temporal. Amen. Those things that are unseen, they're eternal. Amen. Lord, help me not to just look at the temporal things, uh, but help me to see the great and powerful things uh, that, God, you want to do in my life. Uh, that, God, that help me, Lord, to possess the promises uh, that, God, you have laid upon my life. Help oh, me. Yeah. I'm coming to a close. <coughs> A.W. Tozer said, the blessings follow the plow. The blessings follow the plow. We're talking about repentance. We mean break it up the fallow crowd. You see, repentance is a word that you don't hear much today. John the Baptist preached and he said, repent for the evil of heaven is at hand. Jesus' message was prepared for the kingdom of heaven as a man. The apostles' message. In Acts 3 19, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord, you know what they're saying? Repent so that you can possession, position yourself. Yes. For when those times of refreshing come, that you can receive the miraculous things. Where God is going to use you. God will work in you. God will work. God will use you. The cutting away of the flesh, as we talked earlier, is, is in typology. It is repentance. It's dying out to the flesh. Dying out to the flesh. Amen. The Lord is waiting to hear your prayer. Amen. Matthew 7 and 7 says, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. John 14 says, What's, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Mark 11 24 says, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you shall receive them. And you shall have them. James 4 2 says, You have not because you ask not. See, the power of prayer. Amen. It's unlimited because prayer accesses the unlimited power of God. See, prayer is our access to unlimited power. It was when Elijah prayed that the heavens were shut up for three and a half years. And his prayer unlocked the heavens after that. Amen. James 5 and 17 says, Elias or Elijah was a man of Subject to the like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Amen. Prayer is a powerful part of, pos of positioning yourself for God to do something great in your life. You will not receive the blessings and the promises of God without prayer. You see, what John, 
Uh, where does the Bible say that prayer is contingent on me receiving my promises, my blessings? See, prayer is it's about your understanding of prayer. Prayer is your communicate. It is your part of your relationship with God. And that is where all the blessings and the promises and the leading of God is contingent upon that relationship. That's you know the, the whole following God and cutting away the flesh and and and, uh, and our repenting. That's part of coming into relationship with God. Right. Amen. And so tonight, our hope is in. The greatest fear that the devil has is that the church will rebuild the altar of prayer. Elijah rebuilt, it, rebuilt the altar of prayer. He put it in order. He soaked it with water, and the fire of God fell. We can talk about how bad and how wicked and how evil this world is. We can also cry about how worldly the church has become. But nothing will change until we pray. We used to understand that prayer was warfare. We used to call praying or praying saints. We used to call them prayer warriors. Yeah. It's warfare. They're fighting in the spirit. I believe that the only that there's only one way to revival and the only one hope for America, one hope for this for the church. It's not in a different president. It's not in a politician. It's not in a new legislation. It's not in any of the political parties. Because none of them can turn America around. Our only hope is in God. Amen. He is the only one. I've had people come to me and say, John, John, and trying to get me involved in like some political debate. And I told him, I said, I'm looking forward to that day uh, when Jesus sets up his kingdom uh, and he is Lord of all uh, and he rules the world. The lion's going to lay with the lamb. Uh, oh, the devil's going to be chained up for a thousand years. Uh, amen. There's going to be peace on earth. Uh, amen. And Jesus uh, is going to rule. Amen. See, that is, that's who I'm looking for. Where are the prayer warriors today? It's time for personal revival. When we have personal revival, we will have personal power. Amen. You personally, you can't, you can't live off of, I can't live off of my dad's relationship with God. Amen. Amen. You know what? My dad has a really great relationship with God. Amen. But I can't live it doesn't, yeah, his prayers, like like the prayer of Job, his prayers have probably kept a lot of evil from my life. His prayers have probably kept, kept a lot of evil from my family's life. Amen. Job, he sacrificed for his kids. Amen. Before the, the Lord allowed the devil to come in and test him and he sacrificed, he gave sacrifices for his kids just in case they messed up. And he was a righteous man. He prayed. And there was a hedge. And that was about him and his family. Amen. But ultimately it comes down to us. You and I. We, we, we can't always be the children of the ones that came out of Egypt. Yeah. But you've got to become the one that is the children that have been raised up and reared up to go forth and go into the land of promise and to obtain the promises of God in your life. Amen. Amen. As long as you try to hang on to somebody's coattail, you will you will never receive the fullness. You may be around it. You can you can touch it. You can feel it. I mean you can feel God move upon you. <coughs> Amen. But you personally will never receive where God is wanting what God is wanting you to receive until you make the sacrifices right. and you, amen, do what you need to do to right. follow God and, right. and to allow him to take you. Right. Amen. Amen. God wants us to position, position ourselves for, for the miraculous tonight. Amen. What, is, what do you need God to do in your life? You need to position yourself for that. Right. You say, well, it's not in works. Amen. It's not by works. Amen. So 
God wants you to position yourself for that miracle, for Him to do what He needs to do. Amen. You, I've seen I've seen some people that come to church and say, "I want the Holy Ghost," but they haven't repented of all their evil lifestyle. Well, I'm sorry. I can pray with you until I'm I'm soaked with sweat, and you will never receive the Holy Ghost. You won't receive the Holy Ghost until you repent. You can come up and say, oh, you know, pastor's on fire today. He's got fire coming from his fingertips, so I just want him to anoint me and to pray for me, and, and I will receive it. Well, if you haven't repented, it doesn't matter how much fire he's got. If you haven't repented, you're not going to receive the promise that God has promised you. Amen. Amen. I believe that God wants to fill all of you Refill all of you with the Holy Ghost, but He wants to fill some of you with the Holy Ghost. Maybe the first time. Amen. And God is saying, Well, what I need you to do, I need you to position yourself for the miraculous. I need you to position yourself so that I can fill you. Amen. You say, Well, how do I position? Well, if you've truly repented of all of your sins, and only you and God knows that. Amen. So you repent. I'm not questioning your repentance. I'm not a person to question someone's repentance. Neither are you. Amen. God is the only one. He knows. You and him know. Amen. If, if you have truly repented. Amen. You and God know. Amen. If you have truly said, surrendered everything at the altar. And when you when you've surrendered everything at the altar, you've repented. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you've already been baptized in Jesus' name. Then you need to come with faith. And Amen. you need to worship God. And you need to bless the Lord. And you need to, and you don't need to worry about speaking in tongues. You don't need to worry about receiving the Holy Ghost. It will happen. It's a promise from God. Amen. He made that promise. But if you will position yourself, you won't receive the Holy Ghost. So not opening your mouth. You've got to open your mouth and begin to speak to God to receive the Holy Ghost. Because the evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking in other tongues. Amen. And you can't speak in other tongues with your mouth closed. Amen. You've got to open your mouth uh, and you've got to begin to exalt Him. Amen. You've got to begin to worship Him. Uh, and you've got to begin to exalt Him and say, Lord, I love you. I worship you. I want the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus, I love you. I need you. I worship you. And as you begin to worship, you don't need to think about receiving because God's going to fill you up. Amen. He promised you the Holy Ghost. And if you position yourself for the miraculous, you will receive the Holy Ghost. You will receive the Holy Ghost. But here's the thing. A lot of times you get into a comfort zone. Like the people of Israel, they're at work. They've been there a long time. They've been circling the mountain. And God is saying, with the Holy Ghost, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. you got to quit doing what you've been doing. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a good person. You've been circling the mountain. You've been staying close to. I mean, you, you've you got some rushes of the Spirit. And then God's moved on you. God has touched you. But now it's time for the miraculous. Now it's time for the Holy Ghost oh, to be poured out in your life. And in order for you to receive it, you've got a position. You've got to move out of your comfort zone. And you may not feel comfortable lifting your hands. You may not feel comfortable crying out to the Lord. And you may not feel comfortable <coughs> worshiping Him. Amen. Amen. But you need to forget about everybody else. And you need to say, I'm going to position myself to so where God will fill me with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. Amen. Position yourself for the miraculous. I, I, I've seen in, in my short time of living for God, I've seen a lot of people come to the altar, come to the altar begging God. That's not position. So God will never fill you with the Holy Ghost if you're begging for him. It's a gift. If I say, Brother Jeremiah, I've got a gift for you. I got you. You just you just come over here, and I'm going to give you a gun. It's a gift. Now Jeremiah comes over to me and he says, John, can you please give me a gun? John, I really want a gun. Please, please give me a gun. Give me a gun, John. John, I know you told me you would, but please give me a gun. That's that's not the way you approach. You approach in faith. He would walk up to me and say, John, you have a gun. You probably
promised me the gun. Let me have the gun. You promised it to me. You're a man of your word. So here I am. I'm positioning myself Thank you. to receive what, what you have promised me. Amen. And that's how it is with the Holy Ghost. You'll never receive the back of God. Amen. But if you will come and just say, Lord, I believe you. I have faith that you're a man, that you're that you keep your word. You are truth. You there's no lie in you. You're not false, but you're true and you're truthful. And God, you promised me the Holy Ghost. And so I stand here and I worship you for filling me with the Holy Ghost. You worship him before you ever receive it. You worship him before you worship him for receiving it before you ever receive it. Amen. That's faith. That's saying, Lord, I I know you're gonna fill me. Me. And so, Lord, I thank you for it. I worship you. I praise you. I thank you for it because I am positioning myself for the miraculous. Amen. Right. Thank you. you. Gotta come out of your comfort zone. Yep. Yeah. But when God moves on you, He says, Go forward. Yeah. Lift your hands and begin to worship. Yeah. You follow Him. Yeah. You follow Him. <laughs> I don't care if you think you look like, you know, a crazy person. You find, nobody else around matters. What they think doesn't matter. This is between you and God. This is this is a, the greatest miracle that will ever happen in your life. It will be when God fills you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So God, I believe you. I worship you and I thank you for the Holy Ghost. Amen. I believe God wants to fill someone with the Holy Ghost tonight. Amen. Amen. I believe God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost tonight. Amen. If you have never received the Holy Ghost, you need to follow God. You need to obey Him. And you need to get out of your comfort zone. And you need to just express yourself to God and worship Him. And God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. You can. You will need this service up for the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you would just... Uh, get out of your comfort zone and begin to worship God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Dallas, let's... Amen. If you need a healing, Amen. All of the promises.